Hey, Mosaic Church. Welcome to our Mosaic Midweek. We are in this series called Jesus Followers, where we are saying we want to be followers of Jesus. We want to be disciples of Jesus. And what does that look like? Well, during this season of quarantine, I don't know about you, but my family has spent a lot more time together, playing games, doing different things, as also having lots of family movie nights. And we were so excited when Disney Plus came out and we signed up for that service. And since uh, the start of this whole quarantine COVID season, we have decided to watch all the Disney animated movies in order. So starting with Snow White and going up through now we're into the 90s. But the other day, we decided to kind of mix things up, and instead of doing one of the animated movies, we decided to watch one of the remakes that was like with live actors. And so we watched Cinderella, uh, which is a great movie, uh, one of my favorite kind of remakes they did. But at the very end, there's this scene where Cinderella is kind of locked in the tower, and she's waiting to be rescued, and the prince shows up. And there's this moment where she has to approach the prince and she's wondering, will who she truly is, uh, you know, Cinderella, the girl who uh, has lost both her parents and, and is just kind of the servant and isn't this princess or anything, will she be enough? And there's this beautiful moment where she is fully loved and accepted by the prince for who she is. And I think that story resonates with us so much because the reality is that story is an echo of what the story of the gospel is, that all of us are kind of locked in this tower wondering, are we good enough? Will someone ever love us for who we truly are once we stop pretending to be someone else? And the story of the gospel is that we were locked in patterns of sin and death and destruction. And then Jesus, our our prince, he comes and he rescues us and he tells us that we are enough and that we are now a part of his family forever. And I think that that is a beautiful story of what the gospel is. And our prince Jesus, he came from heaven down here onto earth and invited people to follow him, to be a part of this new family that he was building. That's who our leader, our rabbi Jesus is. And Jesus was a rabbi. Jesus is both teacher and Lord. Jesus as our teacher, our rabbi, was similar to other rabbis of his day. He had a yoke, not a literal yoke. He was a farmer. He wasn't a farmer. He was a teacher. But a yoke was this common idiom. We've talked about this that first century rabbis used. It was their way of reading the Torah, the Old Testament scriptures. But it was more than that. It was, it was their set of teachings on how to be human, how to shoulder the weight of marriage and, and divorce and prayer and money and sex and conflict resolution, just all of that. It's kind of an odd image for those of us who aren't farmers, but imagine two oxen yoked together pulling a plow or a cart, and a yoke is how you shoulder that load. And what made Jesus unique wasn't that he had just a yoke, was how he described his yoke. He said his yoke is easy. In Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30, he says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Second, Jesus had apprentices. In Hebrew, that word is Talmudim. I think that's, that's a fun word to say, Talmudim. It's usually translated as disciple, but I think a, a better word even is the word apprentices. And following Jesus, to be his apprentice, it's not something that can just be a hobby for us. This is something that's going to take a full lifetime of dedication to be an apprentice, a disciple, a Talmudim of Jesus. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to become a pastor or, or start some kind of nonprofit, but it does mean that the focal point of your life is to be an apprentice of Jesus. See, Jesus' invitation is to become an apprentice 
not a Christian. You know, the word Christian is only used three times in the New Testament. The word Talmudim, disciple, apprentice, is used 268 times in the New Testament. There's a big difference between just being a Christian and a follower of Jesus. See, a Christian is someone who maybe goes to church when it's convenient or Easter, Christmas. They, they think, you know, that means voting a certain way or, you know, checking a box on a survey that, you know, this is my religion. But being a follower of Jesus means that you are going to orient your whole life around your master, your rabbi, your teacher, your Lord, and say, I want to become like you. See, in Jesus' day, there were, there were lots of rabbis. And in their system of education, and it was a little bit different than ours, that, you know, most of the, the boys, they'd go to school and uh, they would learn uh, the Hebrew scriptures. And so, uh, what they would do is all the little kids, you know, by the time they are about five, so Andrew, my, my kindergartner, uh, what they would do is they would memorize the first five books of the, uh, the Torah, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, memorized. That's in my Bible. That, that, that's this. All of this memorized. And then the best of the best would go on to the next level of Hebrew school. And, and they would study uh, the rest of the Old Testament scriptures, uh, the other 39 books. And eventually, they would have that memorized. Uh, that would be about this much of your Bible memorized. They would study the scriptures. They would know the scriptures. But then only the best of the best of the best would get to be a disciple, a Talmudim, an apprentice of an actual rabbi. Everyone else would learn a trade like, like fishing or carpentry. And so when Jesus is a rabbi, when he invites Peter, James, and John, Andrew, who are fishermen, to be his Talmudim. This is a big deal because rabbis only picked people they believed could become like them. That they were saying, hey, come follow me because I believe you have something in you that you can become like me. So that's why this invitation to follow Jesus is such a huge invitation. There's actually a common saying in, in, in this time of Jesus' day that may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. That you're following so closely behind your, your teacher that you would be covered in his desk, dust as you traveled from place to place. May you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. Because you would learn how to eat like him, how to dress like him, how to talk like him. That your whole life would be oriented around being that apprentice, that follower, that disciple of your rabbi, your teacher. What's beautiful, though, now is that Jesus offers that invitation to follow him to each and every one of us. No matter where you're from, what you've done, what's been done to you, Jesus says, I invite you to follow me. And Jesus says, I believe you can become like me. And so for those of us who have chosen to say, yes, we want to be Talmudims of Jesus, we want to be disciples, we want to be apprentices of Jesus, it's to organize our life around three basic goals. And that's what we're going to be talking about the rest of this month. Number one is to be with Jesus. That's what we're going to talk about today. Is to how do we orient our life around being with Jesus. Number two, it's to become like Jesus. How do we become like Jesus? That's what we're going to talk about next week. And finally, what, to do what he would do if he was walking in our shoes. How would Jesus respond if he was a real estate agent or running a theater company or if he was an executive at Polaris or, you know, whatever it might be. How would Jesus live and act? That, that's what we want to do. And so the first thing we want to talk about is how to be with Jesus. Well, Jesus talks about how we be with him and he used this word called abide. One of my favorite chapters, John chapter 15. Uh, Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross to pay for our sins, to die and then rise again three days later. And as he's having dinner with his closest friends, his Talmudims, his disciples, here's what he says in John 15, verse 1 through 8. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. 
Already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Thanks, Jesus. (laughs) If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my Talmudim, my disciples, my apprentices. Well, how do we abide in Jesus? Jesus is saying that apart from him, we can do nothing. That we need to be plugged into him as the source of our life. That he is that vine. If you've ever been out to uh, Napa Valley or or any place where there's uh, vineyards, that those grapes have to have a structure. They have to have a vine that they're plugged into in order to bear fruit. And Jesus says it's the same thing for us. We can't just bear fruit on our own. We have to be plugged into the true vine, which is Jesus. And we have to have structures around which we are going to grow. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. But here's what Jesus says on how we can abide with him. In John 14, verse 15 through 17, and then 25 to 27, he says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Verse 25, these things I've spoken to you while I am still with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I've said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Jesus is saying that the way to be with Jesus is through the Holy Spirit. See, the first and primary goal of apprenticeship is learning to live in a constant state of awareness and connection to the Holy Spirit. It's learning to live in a constant state of awareness and connection to the Holy Spirit. Here's what Paul, one of the disciples of Jesus who originally opposed him and then Jesus appeared to him and literally knocked him off his high horse. And then Jesus, Paul went from opposing Jesus to being one of his disciples and, and spreading the news of Jesus. Here's what he says in Galatians 5, 16. He's going to use this language of fruit just like Jesus in, in John chapter 15. He says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Now this passage on the fruit of the Spirit is probably one of the most Famous passages in scripture. You know, a lot of homes even have it up on their wall somewhere. You know, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. And growing up, I heard about this a lot. As a college student, you know, as I was learning to to follow Jesus, I remember there was this time where I was like, okay, I am going to embrace the fruit of the Spirit more. And so, you know, this month, I'm going to work really hard on, on having more love. And then, you know, once I get that down, then I'll work on, you know, having more joy. And then more peace and more patience. And, and, and you know, eventually, in like you know, eight months, I'll just have it all down. <laughs> well, if you ever tried that, you can't make yourself more love. And you can't make yourself have more peace or joy or self-control. There's a big difference between you know, information and transformation. And so what happens is oftentimes we read this list like it's a list of commands, like saying, Paul's telling us, hey, you need to be more loving, you need to be more patient, have more self-control. But the reality is Paul doesn't command that. He says this is the fruit that the Spirit brings forth in our life. 
The command here isn't to be more loving or have more self-control or have more patience, to try really hard. There's really one command. Right at the beginning, at verse 16, he says, But I say, walk by the Spirit. That's the command. That when we learn to walk by the Spirit, and through the Spirit abiding in Jesus, that fruit will just come out because we're connected to the vine. See, a, a, you know, a, a vine that is growing grapes can't just try really hard to, to grow the grapes. It just naturally happens to bring forth these beautiful grapes that can create the best wine or, or grape juice or whatever you like to drink. We can't make ourselves more patient, but we can open ourselves up more to the Holy Spirit and let Him lead us. So the question is, how do we learn to walk by, with the Spirit? How do we walk with the Spirit? Well, I believe that the spiritual practices, the spiritual disciplines are non-negotiable if we want to learn to walk with the Spirit. In the same way that, that vineyards have these, these trellises or, or this, this framework that the branches and the vines can grow on, the spiritual disciplines really function like those trellises, those, that framework to help us grow, to give us some structure. You know, another word could be called habits. Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about habits now. You know, one of the best books I read last year was Atomic Habits. I highly encourage that. But the thing is, I think this word spiritual discipline sometimes kind of throws us off. First of all, we don't like the word discipline oftentimes. The second, we think spiritual just means, oh, okay, this just happens, you know, uh, you know in my spirit. Well, they're not actually spiritual they're, because they actually encompass much more than just spiritual. They really encompass our whole body, our, our mind, and our soul. You know, as we learn to deny ourselves by fasting, that's a physical thing. As we spend time in solitude, that's, that's a whole body, mind, and, and spirit thing. You know, uh, just in, in all the ways, like, these things are not just spiritual practices. They really Im, uh, impact our, our bodies and our minds as well as our spirits. But here's the thing to remember. That the spiritual disciplines are a means to an end. They're a means to an end. See, is the point of reading your Bible just to read your Bible? Like, do, do I get up in the morning and grab my Bible and, and it's like, okay, well, I checked this off the list like, because I read my Bible and that's all that matters. No, the point of reading your Bible is not to read your Bible. The point of reading your Bible is to learn to live in the way that Jesus lived. It's to be with Jesus, to connect to the Holy Spirit, to allow him to illuminate God's word so we can learn more about Jesus, to be more like Jesus. The point is to abide in him, not just to check something off the list. The point of the spiritual habits is to walk with the Spirit and so abide in Jesus. And it's important to know that when you do these spiritual habits, these spiritual disciplines, you're not earning anything. Our master, our rabbi Jesus, he went to the cross and he paid the price for each and every one of us. There's nothing left to earn. Salvation is a free gift. We are invited freely to come into his family. We don't have to do anything to earn that. So you're not earning anything by doing these spiritual disciplines. But it's learning to be with Jesus by walking in his spirit. Here's what Jesus said in one of his famous um, parables, Matthew 7, verse 24 through 27. He says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because they had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the wind blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Jesus says that the reason the house made it through the storm had nothing to do with having knowledge. The reason the house stood firm was because they did the right thing. They actually built their house upon the rock. They listened to the words of Jesus, but then they put them into practice. See, it's doing makes the difference. It's not just about knowing the right thing to do. It's about doing the right things. It's about learning what Jesus did and then doing what Jesus did. It's about orienting our whole life to be with Jesus, to do the things that Jesus did, to live as if he was walking in our shoes. And here's the important distinction. It's not about trying. It's about training. 
It's not about trying to earn something from God uh, to make him happy. He loves us. Our Father is well pleased with you and me. He's very fond of us. We don't have to try, but we need to train. If tomorrow I wanted to run a marathon and I got up and tried, I would die. You know what? Five years ago, I was into running and I could run up to 10 miles. Now I could probably run about a mile. And if I wanted to run a marathon, yeah, I truly would die. But the thing is that if I started training and I started running every day and, and you know, I did you know, one long run each week and I added one mile you know, each week and, and slowly over the course of the next you know, 26 weeks or so, I added one mile, eventually I would be able to train my way into running a marathon. See, you and I aren't going to become like Jesus tomorrow. It's not just going to happen. We're going to wake up one morning and be like, oh, I'm fully formed into likeness of Jesus. No, we're going to have to take a lifetime of training to do what Jesus did, train ourselves to be with Jesus, to do what he would do if he was walking in our shoes today. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Imagine with me. If each and every one of us said, you know what, I'm going to reorient my life to be with Jesus, to do the things that Jesus did, to do what he would do if he was walking in our shoes, how different would our communities, our families look? If we trained our kids to walk with Jesus, to be the Talmudim of Jesus, to be apprentices of him, to say, you know, we're not going to live like the rest of the culture. We're, we're going to walk in the spirit. We're going to read his word and learn how to take time of solitude and silence and Sabbath keeping and and rest and and prayer and and the scriptures and and a life of worship and and stepping into our, our spiritual giftings, a life of simplicity and a life of peace. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Imagine if each and every one of us said, you know what, we're going to be a disciple and we're going to make a disciple. We're going to be one, and we're going to make one. Who is it that you can invite with you on this journey of being an apprentice, a Talmudim of Jesus? Maybe it's someone in your home. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's a child. Maybe it's a friend or a roommate. Who can you walk with side by side as you walk with Jesus, yoked with him, letting him carry the heavy weight, going at his pace? And say, you know what, we're going to learn to walk with Jesus. We're going to abide in the Spirit as as, as we learn to change our whole lives as followers of Him. My hope, my prayer is that you choose to follow Jesus. You choose to walk with Him. That you walk in step with the Spirit, becoming more and more aware of what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life. And that as you go on this journey uh, of walking into the spiritual disciplines, the spiritual habits, that they become this framework, this trellis that, that your spiritual life can grow around and that together as branches we are we're plugged into our vine, into Jesus, and he is nourishing us and sustaining us. And as we abide, then the fruit comes in our life. And, and we become more loving, more patient, more kind, more gracious because not we've tried really hard, but we've trained ourselves to walk with Jesus and then he's brought forth this fruit in our life. I'm going to pray and we'll wrap up this week. God, thank you. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, to rise again, and also for teaching us how to live, how to be human. So Jesus, I just pray that this week we would be with you, that we learn to abide in you, we would walk in the spirit and so learn how to live in the way that you lived. Thank you, Jesus, for your love that we don't have to try hard. God, we want to train. We want to train ourselves to to follow in your footsteps, to be covered in the dust of our rabbi. Thank you for your unfailing love and acceptance for each and every one of us. In the name we pray.